Hello, I'm out of focus. Did that happen? No. There we go. Okay. Um, I should probably talk about the final paper assignment actually before I start. Um, Right, so it's due on June eleventh, um, but uh, on June third, that is Monday, you're supposed to hand in an introductory paragraph and outline of the final paper, um, and then uh, the idea is that uh, you should be able to get feedback on that live feedback um in section um like how exactly that will be worked out this year i'm not sure but uh i hope uh enoch and chelsea will both be able to arrange that i mean um either at the regular i mean yeah i don't i don't remember when the sections are so uh might have to be unusual section times or something to make that happen. Um, uh, so, and right, I mean, the idea behind that assignment is, well, number one, that you should start thinking a little bit early about not that early, but I mean, that's the problem, like how early could you start thinking? The class is only 10 weeks long and, you know, um, uh, you couldn't start writing a paper in the middle because you haven't done half the reading yet. So, um, so anyway, I mean, that's why the assignment is, is set up in this way and like, uh, like not to ask for a draft in advance or whatever. Um, but, uh, um, you don't have to use the introductory paragraph or follow the outline that you hand in, but you should definitely hand something in because as you may recall, like the way this is, the way this affects your grade is that it it's not separately graded, but uh, if you don't hand one in at all, then uh, your final paper grade will be reduced by, by one step, like from A to A minus, or is that half a step? I don't know, whatever. Anyway, whatever you call that. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, so therefore you should definitely write one and hand it in. Um, um, and again, the idea is number one, to help you start planning for the paper, but number two, especially if you, if you get some feedback from your TA and, or your fellow students, then it might help you like, uh, rearrange your paper in a way that will make it much better. Um, you know, cause uh, like I, you know, I thought of doing it this way. I first thought of doing this way because I know that I've often kind of got to the end of a paper that a student wrote and said, well, this thing at the end should have been your thesis <laughs> and you could have used the same evidence, but turned it backwards and, you know, it would have been much. So anyway, um, that's the idea there. Now, let me look at the assignment itself. Um, Six to eight pages long. It's due on Canvas. Um, that's the thing I just talked about. 
right? There's a list of topics. There's suggested topics. People usually write about, almost always write about one of those topics, but it's not required. If you want to write about something else that's relevant to the course, you can. Uh, um, it says here, it might be a good idea to check with me and or your TA first. Uh, if you're planning to do that, but I mean, that's just advice. That's not a requirement. Um, and it says, note that the topics tend to have many sub questions, right? So again, if you look at these topics, they're really long. So this one starts, in what sense can our authors be called empiricists? To what extent would, imp would empiricism mean the same thing applied to a each and in what ways would it differ? For example, what is experience for each of them? In what way does it form the sole basis of their knowledge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's a lot of questions. That doesn't mean if you write on this topic, you're supposed to answer all those questions, right? It's like, it's not an essay question. It's a suggested topic for a paper. So it just means like, um, those are just like to get you thinking about wh what this question might mean and some of the sub questions by which you might approach it. Um, uh, so anyway, that's what's going on with those topics. Um, they all they're all comparative topics. Right. So you like. Um, you should write about at least two of the authors um, that we read. Um, you can write about all three of them. Obviously, you don't have like space in this paper to say a lot about all three of them, but sometimes it can be helpful to say just a little about the third one to help explain what's going on. You know, um, uh, If you, yeah, it says if you want to write about only one of the three, that is so that would mean that again that you're not writing about one of the suggested topics because all the subjected suggested topics are comparative. But you, if you wanted to write about your own topic that was only one one, one of the three, then you should check with me or your TA about it first. Uh, and um, you can use outside material. I don't necessarily recommend that. Uh, um, but if you find it helpful, then that's fine. Obviously, if you do, you need to cite it. Um, and as I said at the beginning of the course, I'll say again now, like, I, I don't think I've ever given a failing grade to a paper that someone actually handed in. I mean, I can't promise it will never happen. Obviously, there's some things that people could hand in that wouldn't be papers at all, and I would and I would fail them, right? But it's never happened yet. I've been teaching for a long time. The only time I've gotten a failing grade to a paper that someone actually handed in was one because I caught them plagiarizing. So don't do it, you know. And don't have chat GPT write your paper, please. I mean, it's so obvious when you do it, and it doesn't write good papers and but I mean, anyway, if you want to have ChatGPT write part, part of your paper, put it in quotes and cite it. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. Um, um, right. And the next paragraph says, the intent of the paper is to discuss the views or attitudes manifested in the reading rather than your own opinions on the topic. Right, so it's an interpretive paper. So as I always say to try to explain this, like I'm asking you to do once what I do every for every lecturer. <laughs> try to figure out what the hell these people mean. <laughs> it's not easy to figure out what they mean. It's nothing is about it is uncontroversial. So there's many things that you can argue for and it can be completely original and yet not be your opinion about like, is empiricism true? Or is Locke right and is and Barclay wrong? Or Ray, it's just about like, what is the difference between Locke and Barclay on this point? Right? What do they really disagree about here? It's not clear. <laughs>
it's often not clear. And again, if you think about what happens when I lecture, you know, that's often what I'm trying to point out, that you might think they disagree about this, but if you look at it more closely, you'll see that it's, you know, they really agree about that. It's really something else, you know. So like, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. And there, that kind of combines this paragraph also with this paragraph about what a good comparison is. Um, Right. I also say here that if you're really upset by what an author says or you find it ridiculous, so that can be good if it's like a motivation to try to understand what they could possibly be thinking. <laughs> right. Where you say, this, how could someone say this? And then turn that into a serious question. How could someone say this? Right, so that's often an important step in trying to understand what someone is saying. Uh, Isn't it just like uh, essentially all all philosophers can you can ar argue either side all every time um, with every argument, and that's <laughs> that's like the protagonist, especially with Socrates. Um, well, uh, you, I mean, you can definitely argue either side, whether you can make a good argument for either side is another question, but, yes. you know, <laughs> but, but, um, but yeah, I mean, at this level, when you're first trying to understand a text, um, uh, you know, like in 100B, the first writing assignment is to raise an objection to Descartes and then say how Descartes would answer it. <laughs> that's um, um, like that's an important like movement to go through when you're trying to understand what someone says. Sometimes you can't. Like you just can't figure out what they were thinking. And this just seems like an obvious mistake. And, you know, what, what I say my advice here is well don't write about that write about something else <laughs> if that's if you end up in that situation um so yeah you may not be able to make a good argument for everything but you should choose to write about something where you can make a good argument for it. um uh and yeah i mean these people are not right I mean, usually you can tell that because, of, for example, what they say about physics, <laughs> right? So, uh, um, or sometimes, although this is not as not as trustworthy, like what they say about psychology, or you can tell by what they say about mathematics. So that's a little bit tricky too. But um, you know, I mean, they're not right. There has to be a mistake somewhere, but uh, like that's not really that interesting. I mean, we're not reading them because we think they're right about everything. Why are we reading them? Um, well, I mean, I think the real reason, the, the important reason for philosophers to read the history of philosophy and, you know, like while you're in studying philosophy, you're a philosopher, right? It's not like astrophysics, where being an astrophysicist is one thing and being in an astrophysics course is something completely different. <laughs> or I forget astrophysics, just like regular physics, right? Being in a physics course means doing problem sets, not doing physics research. But in philosophy, it's the, you know, I'm asking you to do the same thing I do. <laughs> so, you know, and what's the reason for philosophers to read the history of philosophy? It's basically because otherwise we don't understand what we ourselves are saying. Like all our terminology and ways of thought come from these people. So uh, so we need to know what they say. And it doesn't matter that they're not right about everything. That's not the interest, that's not the important point. Okay. Anyway. Um, and yeah, basically, like as far as citing sources the main point is just that the ta can figure out what you're citing <laughs> so like if you're using the additions i ordered for the class you should just be able to put the page number or whatever but if 
using some other edition or some outside source, then you need to provide more information so they can find the thing that you're citing. But like, there's no particular format or whatever that's necessary. Um, uh, in philosophy, every journal uses a different citation format. And there's, so there's no, I don't think there's any point in trying to teach you some kind of format. Okay, are there any questions about that before I go back to Hume? Back to you. Okay. And first, I'm going to talk about the modern philosophy that I didn't get to at the end last time. Um, and the modern philosophy, right? So the ancient philosophy, the section on the ancient philosophy, we skipped. That was um, book one, part four, section four. No, section three. Yeah, we skipped that. That was the ancient philosophy. The modern philosophy, which is section five. Sorry, these pens. That's basically mechanism, right? It's basically that view about that the properties of bodies are the primary qualities. Those are the properties they really have and that uh, the way they act on each other is by pushing each other. So um, um, it's that in general, but it's pretty much Locke. <laughs> Right. I mean, it's pretty much Locke's version of it that he's taking on as opposed to Galileo or Descartes or someone else. And why am I out of focus again? Is it because if you could see what was really going on here, like the computer is like balanced on a box and it's <laughs> anyway. Oh, uh, you could see a little bit like on the side of the picture, you can see some of the mess that's down here in the basement, like poking around the back blackboard. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so uh, um, so Locke said, so I mean, so Hume says in, and I'm going to try to summarize quickly what he says so I can get on to the new stuff. Um, Hume says, their argument against the secondary qualities being real properties of bodies is good. And this is the way he reconstructs the argument. So whether this is really Locke's argument or not is a good question. This is the way Hume reconstructs the argument. So first of all, the same object without changing can give rise to impressions of different sensible qualities. Um, oh, and plug the wrong one. Okay. Now I'm back in focus, but I don't know how long that will last. Miss Light. All right. So the same object without apparently changing can give rise to impressions of different sensible qualities. Like in Locke's example, how uh, I can put two hands in the same water at the same time and it will feel warm to one hand and cold to the other hand. Um, so when I say it can give rise to impressions of different sensible qualities, right? What we're thinking, so again, like 
we're back to the philosophical picture, right? That is, we're thinking of a distinction between our impressions and their objects. So, um, so a sensible quality is like a power this thing has um, to cause me to perceive a certain impression. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't draw that part for you. It's just, it makes me perceive the impression. There's the impression. Um, and we're thinking that it does that because its quality resembles the impression. Now, we also, but we also see that it gives rise to this other impression. So it must resemble that impression, but the impressions don't resemble each other. So it can't resemble both of them. So it can't have both of those qualities. So at least some impressions don't resemble a quality in the body that caused them. That's the first conclusion. And remember when Barclay talks about this argument, he says it's more proper to show that we don't know what the quality of the body is rather than that uh, it doesn't have any. Right, so it doesn't show that, it doesn't appear to show that the water is neither warm nor cold. It just shows that we don't know which. <laughs> Only one of the those impressions can resemble the object, but we don't know which. Um, but then Hume says, "Aha!" But in matters of matters of fact, are inferences from effects to causes, and the rule is from like fact, effects we presume like causes. And the two impressions, although I mean, uh, although they don't, they're not the, they don't resemble each other. That they're, they're they're the they're both impressions in exactly the same way, right? That is, there isn't some one of them doesn't have some telltale difference, so that we could say, oh, that must be the one that doesn't really resemble a quality in the body. That's exactly how we got into this trouble. So in that respect, they're alike. They're like effects. And therefore, they should have like causes. So if one of them isn't caused by resembling quality in the body, neither is the other. Now, is that like a logically airtight argument, according to Hume? No, of course it's not. Arguing from effects to causes is always due to the imagination, not reason. Um, so it doesn't proceed by relations of ideas, that is, by showing that the opposite would be a contradiction. Um, but it just, uh, we're, we're forced to conclude that neither of them resemble something in the body because um, uh, of the general features of our imagination that are responsible for us believing in matters of fact in general. At least part of which can be summed up as saying, like effects have like causes. So therefore Hume says they're right to say that we shouldn't or that that like if we think about it this way we'll find we don't believe that these secondary qualities resemble something in the object or i guess like so really to be a little bit more careful what we conclude here is not so much that that, that nothing in the object resembles them as that whether it resembles them or not has nothing to do with its ability to cause them. Right, so none of these sensible oppressions in us 
um, uh, arise in us due to their resembling some quality in the body. So, you know, uh, once we realize this, we don't think of the body that, that, that is the external object as resembling our sensible ideas of it, its secondary qualities. So, like Hume says, okay, fine, agreed, that argument is great. There's only one problem with it. And the problem is, he says, that all the other, all the primary qualities together are not enough to allow us to conceive of anything at all. We need to add color. We can't conceive of something that only has primary qualities and doesn't have a color. So to show this, Hume basically like goes through the primary qualities and kind of like um, shows how each one depends on another and then at the end you're left with nothing dependent but color so like motion for example hume takes it everyone will agree that motion is inconceivable without something that's moved now i mean i think actually like if you say um is that a necessary connection between distinct ideas how do we know that um, well, like, if you remember when he talked about the possibility of a vacuum, he said that motion is basically the same thing as creation and annihilation. I see there's been stuff in that chat that I'm missing, but okay, but nothing important. All right. Um, Oh, someone asked, when will ME9 be posted? Oops. I did not post it. Uh, I'll have to change the due date on that. I'm sorry. Don't worry, you won't be penalized for take, for not doing an ME that I haven't posted. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm sorry, because it's supposed to be due tonight, right? That, that won't do. Maybe I'll make it due Friday or something. It doesn't matter. It's the last one, so... Okay, anyway, sorry. Um, oh, right, so you remember when he talked about the possibility of a vacuum, he said that motion is basically the same thing as creation and annihilation. Right? That is, when something moves, that means it's not where it was before, but rather somewhere else. So the like something was annihilated at one place and something similar was created at another place, so to speak. Um, and by created here, I just mean came into existence from nothing, right? I'm not necessarily talking about someone or something creating it. So, um, um, So those ideas of creation and annihilation involve negation, right? It's like the A becomes not A, or the not A becomes A. Um, and I think 
Hume thinks in general that negation um, is the negation of a certain idea is like a kind of modification of that idea. So it can't be conceived with unless you conceive the idea. And that's not a matter of that's not an example of necessary relation between distinct ideas, right? It's it's the fact that you can't uh, entertain a modified version of that idea unless you have the idea, and the modification is negation. Um, so, uh, um, so like this is why you can't con conceive of motion without something moved, because to conceive of motion means to conceive that something was in this place, and then it wasn't in that place. And meanwhile, it wasn't in this place, and then it was in that place. So you have to conceive of something positive that was negated in one place and then um, went from negation to, to being posited in the other place. Um, and that's the thing moved, right? So motion by itself doesn't allow you to conceive of anything. You have to know what it is that's moving. And I think something similar can be said about the other steps on this list, right? So he says, so what is moved? Well, what is moved is something extended. But Hume says, I've already, I've already proved that extension can't be conceived without some quality that's extended. And remember, that had to be either color or solidity. Now, again, like how we know it has to be either color or solidity is a good question. Um, it, in section uh, five, which we also skipped, that becomes a, a pressing question when he's talking about the materiality of the soul and whatever. But, but in any case, um, in other words, how do we know that? Uh, I mean, so far, smells, according to him, have never entered into this kind of disposition towards each other that we call extension. But how do we know they never will? <laughs> but I think actually in this place, that's not that important because the main point is this is the only primary quality, right? We can add other secondary qualities perhaps besides color, but that's not going to help us. This is the only primary quality. So in order to conceive of something using only primary qualities, well, you know, we, we conceive it as moved, but what's moved has to be an extension. And what is extended has to be ex extension of something. And if we're only allowed to use primary qualities, that has to be solidity. But then he says, well, what's solidity? He says, well, solidity is, um, when one body excludes another other bodies from its place. Right, as he puts it, this is on page uh, 277 in your edition. Book one. Uh, part four, section four, page 277. Oh, but in mine, it's on page 150. The idea of solidity is that of two objects, which being impelled by the utmost force, cannot penetrate each other, but still maintain a separate and distinct existence.
So they don't penetrate each other. Now, actually, like when he talked about penetration before, this was part of the discussion of the indivisibility or the uh, uh, composition of extension out of indivisible parts. Um, when he, he talked about a penetration before, he said that what penetration really amounts to is that first there are two bodies and then there's only one. <laughs> right, because this one moves into the same space as the other one, so now there's only one body. And so he says, like, basically what that means is, what penetration means is that one of the bodies has been annihilated, but we can't tell which one. Right, because if we could tell which one, we would say, oh, this one has, like, destroyed the other one. But when they, they come together... And they keep moving towards each other, and then they keep moving, and they keep moving, and there's only one, but we can't tell which one of the original ones it was. That would be penetration. So, uh, so again, like from that point of view, you can see right away why um, solidity is going to have to be solidity of something, right? That is, solidity means that when these objects get close to each other, Neither of them will be annihilated, but they'll just stay there, no matter how much force is. But for something not to be annihilated means, like, for whatever property this has not to be changed into its negation. And that has to be some property. <laughs> so solidity has to be solidity of something. Or if you don't like that very, like, abstract explanation of that you can just see solidity means this won't move into the into the space of this but there has to be some difference between these two things for that to make sense right what won't move into the space of what like if all both of these have is solidity then there's no line here so like the way Locke tried to distinguish himself from Descartes, Hume is saying basically won't work. Like all you have is solidity. How can you tell if the pieces of it are moving or what? They're all the same. <laughs> there must be some other quality besides solidity that makes them what they are. And then solidity tells you, you know, when the red one and the blue one come together, no matter how much force you put, they'll still be red here and blue here. So, um, so solidity in turn can't be conceived without some other quality of which, um, which takes up space, right? The other qualities we're talking about here have to themselves be extended. So we can say this one is, is in this body and the other one is in this body. And what's left, and, and Hume says, well, color. And it, so, as I said, it's not that important to, that we're sure that it has to be color. I mean, maybe it can be heat and cold. Maybe it can be anything. But the main point is, it's not a primary quality, whatever it is. So Hume says, this modern philosophy, although it... Uh, looks so much more rational than the ancient Aristotelian philosophy actually is totally incoherent. Right, that we're talking about, we're saying that the world consists only of things that are inconceivable because they're like, the world consists of motion around each other of things that are indistinguishable from each other <laughs> or like of extension of nothing but the ability to keep out other extension which how could you tell if it kept it out or not <laughs> they're both they're the same right so the like this doesn't make any sense we're not thinking the modern philosophy the way the modern philosophers say the world is is not a way a world could be because we're not even and not because it's contradictory exactly but because we're not thinking about anything when we think about it 
Right, we're like thinking of negations without something to be negated. Um, now, of course, if you ask, how would Locke respond to this? Or why doesn't Locke reach this conclusion? Well, um, So remember, Locke says that solidity is a simple idea that I get by means of the sense of touch, and that when I get that simple idea, and it's right, it's the kind of idea that Hume would call an impression. So let's call it an impression. When I get that simple impression, I know that the body won't let my hands get any closer to each other. Unless it moves out of the way. Um, so Hume's response to that, this is on page... 270, bottom of page 279, top of page 280 in your book. The impressions of touch are simple impressions, except when considered with regard to their extension, which makes nothing to the present purpose. And from this simplicity, I infer that they neither represent solidity nor any real object. And then he goes on to give a long discussion about like how, how you can, oops. Wait, was I just showing the book when I read that or not? You were. Okay. I don't know how I, all right. Okay. Um, um, so, right. So then he goes on to dis like discuss all these like kind of thought experiments by which you can convince yourself. Uh, but I think, I mean, the point itself is actually pretty simple. It's just saying like, if solidity is a simple impression, how can it represent something beyond itself? Like, how can the t I tell from the fact that I'm having this impression that my hand won't go through something? So it really kind of comes down again to the same old disagreement between Locke and Hume about whether there's visible necessary connections, right? That, that's exactly the place where Locke brought in a visible necessary connection to explain the connection between solidity and impulse. Um, so uh, So this argument, although it's, like in a way seems very strong. I'm not sure it's really a new argument against Locke in addition to things he's already said. Um, okay, that's everything I wanted to say about the modern philosophy. Are there questions about that before I go on? Okay. So I'm gonna talk about personal identity. Um, okay, so we start with this. This is on page 299 um, your book.
There are some philosophers who imagine we are every moment intimately conscious of what we call our self, that we feel its existence and its continuance in existence, and are certain beyond the evidence of a demonstration, both of its perfect identity and simplicity. Um, so it's not actually clear what philosophers he has in mind here. Um, so I don't think it's Locke, right? I mean, Locke does say we have intuitive knowledge of our own existence, but he doesn't say we have knowledge of our own perfect identity and simplicity. Um, I don't think Locke thinks that we have perfect identity and simplicity, right? Not in Hume's sense of identity. Um, let alone that we know it intuitively. So we're not talking about Locke. Now, I mean, could you could you be talking about Descartes? Um, maybe. Um Although, if so, I think it's a, probably an interpretation of Descartes that I wouldn't agree with. Um, because the issue is, if I go back to what he says, um, we feel its existence, right? So, I mean, this is a way that some people interpret Descartes, including, I guess, it's the way Husserl interprets Descartes. So uh, where you think that the, that the cogito argument, I mean, that it isn't really an argument. Well, but it isn't an argument in the following sense, because there, there's many ways in which it isn't, you could say it isn't really an argument, but it isn't an argument. It's a report of direct perception. Right, like I directly perceive my own existence and there couldn't be better evidence than that. Um, and that is the way Husserl thinks about arguments and uh, uh, um, as opposed to like direct intuition. Um, but I don't think that's the way Descartes thinks about it. And I don't, there's nothing in the second meditation about feeling that I, my own existence. Um, we are certain beyond the evidence of any demonstration that we exist, or at least beyond the evidence of any other demonstration. But it isn't because we feel it. It's because if we attempt to doubt, doubt it, we land in a contradiction, which um, I guess Hume ultimately is going to agree with, in fact, in the appendix, <laughs> right? That um, uh, although it's not clear what the contradiction is. Hopefully I get a chance to talk about that. But um, but yeah, so somehow um, uh, in the end, Hume may really agree with Descartes about this, uh, but not with what he thinks Descartes means. <laughs> right. So... Uh, um, I mean, the difference then would be that Hume draws a skeptical conclusion, right? Continues in the skeptical method, whereas Descartes, as he says, engages in the skeptical method only in order to find something certain from which he can then rebuild. Um, and Berkeley, I mean, Berkeley does think we're certain about something like this. But of course, not because we have any idea of it, right? We don't have an idea. He does think we can be certain. I can be certain that I'm a spirit and that the spirit is something simple and active and whatever. But he doesn't think it's because I have any idea of a spirit. So we're not talking about Barclay here either. Um, so I'm not really sure who he's thinking of. <laughs> okay, but in any case, I mean, well, I guess I should say one more thing about it. Uh, so it's possible he's thinking of someone else that I that I don't know about. That's very possible. Um, it's possible, as I already mentioned, that he's thinking about Descartes, but he understands Descartes differently than I do. 
But it's also possible that he thinks that the real things that Descartes and Locke and Barclay say are uh, just unintelligible. I can't make any sense of them. And so he like reconstructs a position that does make some sense <laughs> in order to refute it. Um, I think philosophers often do things like this in the history of philosophy. And this is one of the cases where I think it might be happening. Um, okay, so anyway, how does he refute it? Um, so he says, I, I mean, he says, we have no idea of a self in that sense. Because the idea would have to be derived from an impression. And what impression would that be? Um, So we have no such experience, nor have we any idea of self after the manner it is here explained. But from what impression could this idea be derived? This question is impossible to answer without a manifest contradiction and absurdity. So what's the contradiction and absurdity? Well, I mean, um, So the way he explains this, I find a little bit unclear, but um, um, but I think what he means is, so like, first of all, if there were such an impression, it must, it would have to be a constant impression that we were always having, he says, because the idea would be, it's weird, to, why go by way of the idea and why not just say, according to these people, we're always having this consciousness of self and that would be an impression and there is no such impression. But I guess he means not only is it wrong, but we don't even understand it, like we can't even imagine it. Does that make sense though? We imagine an idea continuing, always constant. I, I don't know. Anyway, um, uh, so there just is no such impression, right? Like kind of like a certain color that you always see or something like that is what we're thinking of here. Um, by the way, I maybe should say, since I mentioned Husserl, that Husserl actually changed his mind about this. If you don't know who Husserl is, that's okay. But if you do know who Husserl is, <laughs> Husserl actually changed his mind about this. I mean, he was a like very important, mostly early 20th century, a little bit late 19th century, mostly early 20th century philosopher, very influential. Um, and Descartes was an important influence on him, but as was Hume. <laughs> So he actually started out agreeing with Hume about this. In, the, in his early work, Logical Investigations, he said, you know, I agree with Hume. Like, whenever I look inside myself, I just see some present uh, experience or whatever. I don't, uh, I, don't, I don't find any constant ego. And then uh, he changed his mind about that. And the second edition of the Logical Investigations, he like added a note. I have since learned to see it. <laughs> so anyway, um, but right. So Hume says there is no such impression. I mean, so far, that's there's no absurdity or contradiction. It's just wrong. Um, what is someone saying in the chat?
Oh, right. So Josephine says, from what little I know about Husserl, I don't see how you could have a Husserlian life world without a self-subject. Yeah, so the life world thing is from much later in Husserl, and the logical investigations is before that, and that's that's the answer. <laughs> right. So, um, by the way, I think... Um, both Heidegger and Carnap thought the logical investigations was good and everything after that was bad. <laughs> uh, but anyway, let's, uh, I mean, I actually, I know that best about Heidegger. Heidegger actually like has a um, footnote where in Being in Time where he acknowledges Husserl and he says, you know, uh, mm -hmm something about like the great breakthrough he made in the logical investigations and he pointedly doesn't mention the ideas <laughs> um all right anyway um back to hume um okay so there's no contradiction it's just wrong to say that there is such an impression um but i think the contradiction is that since there is no such impression um what I call myself uh, must actually be composed of like a whole series of manifestly different ideas and impressions. And then when I try to say that that is simple and uh, um, I, and perfectly identical, that's a contradiction, right? So it's the same contradiction, even though like, again, I feel like he doesn't say that very clearly which may mean I don't understand what he's saying. <laughs> um, but I think it's the same contradiction we saw in, you know, well, actually, we didn't read this part. It's the same, it's the same type of thinking that he identifies behind, like the Aristotelian idea of substance, for example. Right? The like um we uh if something changes slowly or at least if all the stages are related to each other, we have a tendency to think of it as the same. But then if we stop to look at the different stages, we'll see that they're not the same, so it's a contradiction. So to resolve it, we invent a simple self-identical thing and call it the substance that's somehow behind the impressions. I guess, I mean, it's it's pretty much similar to the contradiction and the resolution we saw, even when he was talking about the common or like vulgar view of the independent existence of uh, sensible objects, right? It's when we when we when we think of the 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 different interrupted parts together in the memory the mind passes easily from one to another and so we have a tendency to think it's just one thing but then when we look at the separation we say that doesn't seem to be one thing and in order to resolve the contradiction we invent a continued existence of that thing when we can't see it all right so um so so he's saying like the invention of the self is similar But then apparently, um, uh, the advantage of the intellectual world, that is the world of ideas and impressions as opposed to their objects, which are bodies, right? And And again, like, except in the section where he actually talks about skepticism with respect to the senses, he always goes back, as he promises he will, right? He always goes back to talking as if our ideas and impressions have objects that are outside of them and whatever. So, um, so apparently the advantage of the intellectual world over the sensible world is supposed to be that I can reject this fiction without embracing some other contradiction like the modern philosophy. Um, 
because I guess um we're not tempted to think of the self as I'm not sure this is the real reason actually but I'll say it anyway because we're not tempted to think of the self as continued and distinct from the self <laughs> right we're tempted to think of bodies as continued even when we're not perceiving them and as distinct from and independent of ourselves but we're not tempted to think of ourself as existing even when we don't perceive it and as uh, distinct from itself um so uh that maybe is why he he thinks that uh that this contradiction that we're being driven towards in the case of personal identity we can avoid um But then there's the appendix. So the appendix, um, I'm not sure, probably, certainly someone knows more about this than I do. I know the appendix appeared in this, at the end of the second volume and the very first time it was printed. So in other words, it's not something he added years later or something like that. Uh, what am I looking for here? Page 398 in my book. But in your book, it's going to be page 675. Um, so even though he starts off by saying, you know, like, I've learned that people tend to misunderstand what I say, and I also notice certain errors and whatever, like, I'm, it's not like a lot of time has passed for this. <laughs> um, uh, but nevertheless, it was enough time in at least one case for him to decide on an important topic that he was really wrong. Um in fact, he says exactly one case, right? He says this is the this is the only mistake I've noticed of that kind that I've noticed so far, right? So, um, right? I had entertained some hopes that, however deficient our theory of the intellectual world might be, it would be free of those contradictions and absurdities which seem to attend every explication that human reason can give. Of the material world. But um, but what? Sorry, sorry, I said volume two, but I meant volume three. The first time volume three was published in 1740, it already had the appendix. So that was a year after volume one was published. Um, so that's the amount of time in between. It's not that much. Um, um, but I don't know, for example, whether someone might have seen the manuscript of volume one earlier and no, but then why wouldn't he have just revised it before it went to the printer? I mean, assuming that it's not all some trick on Hume's part, which I wouldn't put past him. <laughs> That he didn't plan to write the appendix all along, but yeah, I, I I have no reason to think that. So yeah, he changed his mind over the course of that year. Um, okay, so um, right, so I I had to entertain these topes, but now I realize that no, I I you know we can't form any coherent doctrine here either. Um. And he says, um, he says, 
And this gives me even more reason to be diffident and skeptical. <laughs> In other words, I'm not sure uh, that he thinks of this as, I think he doesn't think this is a disaster. Um, uh, it's disappointed his hopes, but um, but I don't think he thinks it means like this something wrong with the whole system. It's just it's just more of the same thing that we saw in other parts of the system, namely that we reach, you know, if we think about things carefully, we reach conclusions that we can't maintain or that aren't consistent with each other or whatever. Um, but okay, so but what is the problem though? So that's that's the question. Um, and I think there's, you know, among readers of Hume, there's no consensus about this. And it's easy to see why, because he says almost nothing about what the problem is, right? I mean, he like basically lays out again what he said about it before. And then he suddenly says, um, I shouldn't have put this close. I always say that. I never do it. Yeah. yeah, so this is the bottom of, of 677, top of 678 in your book. But all my hopes vanish when I come to explain the principles that unite our successive perceptions in our thought or consciousness. I cannot discover any theory which gives me satisfaction on this head. So he doesn't say what theories he tried and why they didn't give him satisfaction. So it's very hard to figure out exactly what the problem is. Um, and um, um, I go back and forth about whether it's something, I mean, of course, what you want to think is he noticed the very thing that led Kant to the transcendental deduction, right? That like personal identity is a condition of possibility for representation or something, you know, and that therefore there, you know, it was impossible to uh, maintain skepticism about it. Or, you know, I, I just, um, it's a little hard that to get out hard to get that out of the words, but all my hopes vanish when I come to explain the principles that unite our successive perceptions. I mean, I guess again, the question is what principles did he try or or what went wrong? Was that he couldn't find good principles? But that doesn't seem right because for the last few pages, he discusses what the principles are. Right. So like the main principle and, and in the in the body of the book also, you, you know, so the main principle is resemblance, right? Like our, um, our our states of our mind at different times resemble each other quite a bit. And he says they especially resemble each other because of memory. And memory means that we keep having and this seems to be a different understanding of memory than Locke has. Memory meaning, means that we keep having ideas that resemble our previous impressions and ideas. So since that keeps happening, there's a lot of resemblance throughout the series, right? In other words, even, although of course this isn't true either, but even if I saw something completely different every day, every day I would also be remembering the things I saw in previous days. And that would make all the days pretty similar despite the different impressions, right? They would all have those same memory ideas in them. Um, so, but um, then he, he also talks about practical identity, which I'll say something about in a second. But in any case, so there are all these principles. So the problem doesn't seem to be that he can't find the principles. Uh, 
um, at least he doesn't mention a reason why those principles wouldn't work. So the problem is somehow deeper than that. Um, now, possibly, and this would connect it to Kant on my way of reading Kant anyway, the the issue is what, what it means for me to take all those ideas as memories to begin with. How can I represent them as memories? To, so to represent it as a memory, right? Like just having an idea where at some time in the past I had an impression like that doesn't make it a memory. For it to be a memory, I have to think of it as being like... Um, an effect or a sign or something of the fact that I had that impression before. So it seems like there's a representation of self involved in taking something to be a memory. Maybe that's the problem that's getting to him. Um, and like I said, if that were the problem, I think it's pretty similar to what Kant is saying. Um, but uh, um, I'm not going to go into that further here. Um, Okay, now, as I mentioned, Hume also makes this distinction. He doesn't use these terms, but he makes a distinction between what I would call theoretical and practical identity. Um, So theoretical identity is about my belief that I'm the same thing that was also in the past and will also be in the future, right? And again, remember, identity means sameness. So theoretical, so so like trying to account for theoretical, for our belief in our theoretical identity. And again, Hume doesn't use the word theoretical here, but I, I think he talks about, I don't know, beliefs versus passions or something like that but i but i think this is a good way of of explaining the difference so th my, so like my theory my belief that i or like trying to account for my for my belief in my theoretical identity is trying to account for my belief that something i'm something that's the same now as it was before and again, he wants to explain that as an illusion, <laughs> right? Not as a correct inference, but as an illusion that arises from resemblance and contiguity and whatever between my ideas. Um, um, but uh, uh, then he then there's some problem with that. The practical identity is like my desire for um, um, like pleasure for something in the future because it's me. <laughs> um, or maybe I should say it's my taking something in the future to be me by desiring pleasure and for it and not wanting pain for it. Um, right, so it's like my present concern for my future self, or that is my taking myself to have a future self by 
having the kind of concern for it that I do. So, right, so, I mean, this is pretty close to what Locke talks about when he talks about personal identity, right? Remember, Locke said identity is a forensic concept. So, like, again, Locke, whatever Locke thinks about personal identity, he doesn't think we have an intuition of the simple identity of some thing that's always exactly the same, right? It's... Uh, um he um he thinks personal identity is about uh um i'm the same as whatever person in the future i can be motivated by rewards and punishments to right so if there's a person in the future such that, and I mean, you have to like, you have to qualify this somehow, and maybe it would actually be hard to work out. But you have to qualify it somehow because, like, maybe I don't want my friends to be punished in the future either, right? But that doesn't mean I think they're me. So, but, but, you know, but it's the person who, like, remember, according to Locke, like, my will is always determined by plain pain and pleasure, and that means my pain and pleasure, not someone else's. If I care about someone else, according to Locke, that means that I take pleasure in something good happening to them. So I want something good to happen to them because of the pleasure that I'll get. <laughs> right. So, um, um, but it's but the pleasure that I'll get doesn't mean the pleasure I have right now. It means it includes the pleasure I get from it in the future. And therefore, you know, if you want me to do something, you can say, um, if you do this now, I'll reward this person, this human being in the future with pleasure. And that human being is you. <laughs> and I say, sure enough, that's me in the future. And I want that me in the future to get pleasure. And that's why I would do what you wanted me to. And similarly, on the other hand, with pain and punishment and whatever, right? So, um, um, so Hume says, uh, I'll I'm going to talk. So, I mean, first of all, he just he brings in he discusses practical identity somewhat here because it's he says it serves to reinforce our belief in theoretical identity. Because he says that, like, since the different stages of the self all work together towards common ends. Um, they they take on a kind of strong relationship of the kind that especially make, makes us inclined to attribute identity to something when it doesn't really have identity, right? Like a boat, you know, like the ship of Theseus. Although I guess the ship of Theseus wasn't actually being used as a ship. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> but some kind of ship, right? That uh, where like we replace all the pieces one after another. And in the end, it's not the same thing at all. But it's very closely related in the sense that all the stages of it are being used for the same purpose, right? Like, I mean, you can imagine it, of course, it's more complicated than this, but imagine like this was all part of one journey, <laughs> you know, we're sailing from Greece to China or whatever. And as we go, we have to keep replacing, but it's all part of, they're all working. Every stage is working for the same. So that, that tends to make us disregard all the differences. The mind passes easily through the stages and think mistakenly that there's something identical. And he says this practical identity also, you know, therefore has that effect when we think about ourselves. But um, but he says he's going to like explain this elsewhere or he's going to discuss it elsewhere. But um, although the editors point to a place in book two, the editors, I guess, of my edition is what I mean there. 
point to a place in book two, I look there and I don't think he really discusses it there either. So uh, as far as I know, he, he doesn't ever come back and try to explain why we have this concern for our future self. Locke says, but this is hard to understand, that the, that the person I care about is the one who's going to remember being me. But I had trouble explaining that when we saw it in Locke, and I didn't even know if Hume agrees with that. Okay, that's all I want to say about practical, a bit about uh, personal identity. Are there questions about personal identity? Is any going to discuss the conclusion of book one? That is section seven. I guess, um, yeah, I have a question. Okay. Is this, I'm realizing it looks like I'm naked. I'm promise I'm not naked. I'm wearing a top that is cut off under the shoulders. Um, Why? Uh, 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 right. <laughs> I guess I have a question, which is, um, did this very unorthodox like sense of personhood influence law or Hume's ethics or politics at all? Or is this another thing where he kind of just goes, everything you think you know about personhood is wrong, but anyway, forget about that and act like it is right. <laughs> like he was, because I know we haven't talked about his politics, but he was a political thinker, right? And this seems like it would have implications for politics and for ethics and for law and all these things. Did it in his work and in his life? That's a good question. And so, by the way, like it's kind of every other year when I teach this course, at the end, we read the second inquiry, which is the part about uh morals but um this year is one of the years we're reading the dialogues concerning natural religion instead but um i don't think it does i don't think it does have an effect but it's a good question because maybe i just haven't looked for it but but offhand, I have to say, it's just like the thing, skepticism about matters of fact doesn't have any effect on his history of England, <laughs> right? It, he doesn't, it's not like he ends every paragraph, but this is just something I think because of an association based on a present impression. <laughs> um, similarly, when he talks about ethics and politics, he doesn't... Um, ask whether there's such thing as human beings or whatever. Now, I mean, if if there were an account of practical identity somewhere, that obviously would be important, as we just as we saw it was in Locke, um, or at least could be important. Because, you know, because, yeah, I mean, that, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That's going to have to do with what you're doing when you when you punish someone. Um, but like I said, I don't I don't know of any place he comes back and discusses that. I, I'm not, you know. I'm not really an expert on anything, and I'm not a Hume expert. So the fact that I'm not aware of any place he discusses it doesn't mean that there isn't some place he discusses it. But you know, um, but I'm not aware of a place he discusses it, and I and I haven't noticed an effect of it in his ethics and politics. That's all I can say. All right. So that was a good question, but the basic answer is I don't know. I don't think so, but I don't know. <laughs> any other questions? Okay, so I'm going to discuss section seven. It's about 10 minutes left. That's okay. Uh, so, um, right, section seven, the, that is book one, chapter four, no, book four, book one, part four, section seven is titled Conclusion of Book One, right? So it's really a conclusion of the whole book, not just of part four. Um, but 
Um, and it's kind of, it's the transition to book two. And it involves basically an elaborate dramatic fiction, similar to the meditations. Um, right, so, uh, uh, you know, when I teach the meditations, I always emphasize that it's this isn't really a um, kind of a stream of consciousness thing that Descartes wrote as he was thinking some stuff one night, <laughs> right? It's like the meditator is a character and Descartes already knows before he starts writing it where the meditator is going and what the what the conclusion is going to be and, you know, and carefully arranges it, right? So, um, so there's something similar going on here, but instead of going through an argument, this Hume character... Let's say it's supposed to be Hume. Um, this Hume character, instead of going through an argument, goes through a series of like moods. <laughs> and there's actually, there's three stages. Oh, right, the first stage and three stages each one has two parts and i understand what the first part is but i don't understand what the second part is but i'll write you know so the first stage is melancholy and delirium this is the stage where you know he thinks to himself uh like um um how uh, um, all the conclusions he it's 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 kind of like an echo of something he said earlier um where it's like but what am i saying that this kind of philosophical meditation has no influence on us on the contrary right now i find myself feeling uh that um you know I can't possibly put any faith in my senses or my reason and uh, um, um, and there's certainly no point in my going on to write book two. <laughs> so like we're in suspense. Will book two get written? <laughs> I, I mean, uh, um, like... This character is, is saying, I'm done. <laughs> um, and then the second stage is what he calls spleen and indolence. So this is the stage where, so he says, you know, what happens is, um, so I'm in this melancholic, delirious mood. Um, philosophy has no way of counteracting this, right? Like the harder you think about these issues, the worse it gets, because the problem comes precisely from thinking too much, right? Like thinking too far, <laughs> um, not just uh accepting the you know your habitual the way you habitually proceed from one thing to another so uh so there's no way out of it by thinking but he says what happens well you know i just get distracted i eat you know I, I dine i play a game of backgammon i have a party with my friends whatever and he says you know and when I, when i'm done with that and i look back at what i was working on before i find all those reasonings cold strained and ridiculous <laughs> These are all famous lines, especially that cold, strained, and ridiculous, right? 
So where does the spleen and indolence come in? Well, so the indolence is that, you know, I have no inclination to take up this stuff again, right? I look back at it and I'm like, that's not the real world. The real world is backgammon and, you know, dinner and whatever. This is just some thing that somehow... Uh, a mood that somehow got a hold of me where I started thinking too much. Um, so I'm not going to do it anymore. That's the indolence. But he says, I remember enough of what I was thinking that I'm angry. So in other words, it's not just when I say I find them cold, strange, or ridiculous, it's not just like, oh, okay, whatever. I don't know what that was about. It's It's like... Wow, this stuff really made me miserable for no good reason. And he says that this that's what he, at this point he wants to throw his books and papers in the fire. <laughs> that's the spleen, right? So what happens? He says, does does philosophy have a cure for that? Is there some argument? No, Hume, it's okay. You should you shouldn't throw your books and papers in the fire. You should go on working. You should write book two. We're still in suspense. Is there going to be book two? Right? Um, is there some argument that convinces him? He says, no. What happens? After a while, I get tired. I played enough backgammon. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, I start thinking about stuff again. So he says, you know, there's, I return to a mood of serious good humor. And then I'm ready to write book two. <laughs> so first of all, the reason I say this is a dramatic fiction is that, again, he writes as if he's ha going through all these moods at the moment he's writing. Right. He says, like, I now feel. And then he's like, but now I feel. <laughs> um, but of course, you know, me, I mean, as with the meditations, I'm not, it's not necessarily the case that Descartes never went through an argument like this. Presumably he did, although also presumably there were a lot more false starts and whatever, right, than the way it's written down in the meditations. So, I mean, I'm not saying that it's a fiction in the sense that Hume never went through uh, mood, moods like this, but it is a fiction in the sense that um, he invites you to think that um, he's going through them right now as you're reading it, basically. Right, so that that's um, um, that's the effect of a of a fictional story, not of a true report, um, or I mean, not of a non-fictional report. Because again, it's not really about it's really about genre, not about truth, whether it's true or false. <laughs> right, it's like, um, and you know, I mean. There's no way, you know, he must have revised this manuscript and he got it back from the printer and revised it again and whatever, there, right? There's no way every single time he went through these moods, <laughs> right? So it's, uh, so so why is he writing it that way? And like, presumably, as in the meditations, he's somehow trying to get you to identify with him. Um, okay, I, I could say a lot about that, but I only have one minute left. But I think, um, well, okay, let me just finish the thought about identifying with him. So I guess when I say identify with, it's actually close to the what a bit to the discussion of personal identity. 
right? He wants us to like um, feign that his planes, pains and pleasures affect us, to pretend that they affect us. And in that sense, to pretend that he is us. <laughs> um, and why? I mean, as a form of catharsis, maybe? Right? Like, bring us through these, em these emotions so that we can approach book two in a mood of serious good humor. There's one other thing I want to wanted to mention. It's I don't know if it's important. It's probably not important. It's probably just kind of clever, but maybe it's important. These are, this is an allusion to humoral medicine, right? Like there, that is the, in the body, there's a mixture of four, four humors, black bile, yellow bile, blood and phlegm. <laughs> and uh, melancholy means that you have an excess of black bile in your brain in particular. And that was how they explained, you know, basically what we call depression. And then like spleen. So they thought that yellow bile was produced by the spleen. There's no such thing as black bile, really. There really is such thing as bile, I guess, but it's produced by the liver. But anyway, they thought that yellow bile was produced by the spleen. So, and I... I I doubt that Hume, I think some people still believed in this and well, some people still believe in it now. What am I saying? But I think I, I think it was still it was controversial in serious circles in Hume's time, but I don't I doubt Hume actually took this theory literally, but he's using it as a metaphor, right? And a split so a splenetic temperament means you have too much yellow bile, and that tends to make you angry, right? So in this good humor, I mean, I'm not sure. And actually it makes a difference which way you think of it. Maybe that means you have all four humors in the right balance, right? So that would be the healthy state. Or maybe it means you have an excess of blood and that would be the sanguine state, right? So if you think of it as the healthy state, we think, oh, okay, he's gone back to a healthy state where he can keep writing the book for us. But if you think of the sanguine state, then you think, oh, he's gone back to the, and I mean, right, sanguine literally means bloody, right? But we use sanguine to mean like over-optimistic because of this. They thought if you had too much blood, that would make your temperament overly optimistic, right? So... Like, if you think of this as the sanguine state, that would mean uh, Hume has gone back to irrationally deciding to continue right book two. Um, okay, that's all I have time for to say for now, and I will see you next week. And I don't know if we'll go back to in person. I, I feel like probably not at this point, but I guess we'll have to see what happens. Okay, anyway, see you later. Bye. You press. Right.